lies the Italian Midland, some 60 miles northwest of Naples to some 40 miles southeast of Rome. A wide, flat corridor enclosed between four walls of mountains. In winter, the highest peaks of the Liria Range ascend into the snow, but the valley floor with its olive groves and ancient vines, its crops of wheat and corn, is green the year around. That is, in normal times. Last year was a bad year for grapes and olives, and the fall planting late. Many fields lay fallow. There are two ways from the south into the valley. One a narrow path, the other a high scenic road over the mountains. They converge before the site of the ancient village of San Pietro which for 700 years has stood at the threshold of Leary Valley, welcoming the traveler. The stones of its walls were quarried out of the parent hill from whose slopes it rises. Population 1412 of the last census. A farming community. Patron St. Peter. Point of interest, St. Peter's, 1438. No interesting treatment of chancel. As St. Peter's was erected by those who were to worship there, so each original dwelling was built by the ones who were to live there. And this practice has endured down through the centuries. The Italian peasant is a born mason. He cuts and lays and mortars in the stone with great skill and patience, building not for himself alone, but for future generations. From the end of October 1943 until the middle of December, San Pietro and the surrounding ground was the scene of some of the bitterest fighting on our Fifth Army front. The Italian campaign had entered its second phase, to push forward again after a static period brought on by heavy seasonal rain. Our battle lines were haphazard as the terrain itself, with its flood-swollen rivers that twisted back and forth across our line of march, so that each river seemed like five, and where there was no river to cross, a mountain blocked our goal. Each peak ahead being a few meters higher than the last we had won so that each new peak had to be fought for the hard uphill way with the enemy looking down our throats. They had had time to fortify and camouflage their position. No amount of artillery fire or aerial bombardment could force them to withdraw. That was for the infantry to do. Employing those weapons to confine and destroy life in narrow trenches, caves, and fighting holes. It was up to the man with the rifle, the man under fire from all weapons, the man whose way all our weapons, land, air, and sea, serve only to prepare. It was up to the foot soldier to attack a hidden enemy over ground that was sown with mines, the anti-personnel S mine, that fly up at a football to explode beneath the ground. Nowhere along the entire front were enemy preparations more elaborate than in the San Pietro area. For San Pietro stands at the threshold of Leary Valley, and through Leary Valley, wide and level, runs the most highly prized length of road south of Rome. By early December, we had taken and were holding high ground to the northeast, east, and south of San Pietro, the Camino Maggiore hill mass being last to fall. Italian troops under Allied command had made a vain attempt to capture Mount Lungo, possession of which would have acted greatly to our benefit in the impending action. But so excessive were the losses on Mount Lunga that further operations against its strategic heights were deemed unwarranted. It was thereon determined to make a direct frontal assault on enemy positions around and within the San Diego. 
battalion of the 36th Texas Infantry Division were rotated from position to position overlooking the valley so the troops might study the terrain ahead from various viewpoints. was continuous. Day and night, units went out to reconnoiter the ground, draw fire, take prisoners, thus adding to the sum of our information about the enemy. High point, Mount Lungo 351 and Mount Sinutro's 1205 and 950 were all manned in force. The town itself was strongly garrisoned with numerous mortar, machine gun, and heavy weapon emplacements. Four enemy battalions were dug into a line of connecting trenches and mutually supporting pillboxes in depth that extended from the base of Mount Lungo, northeast across the valley floor to the base of Mount Sinutro. Another battalion was organized to defend the high ground northwest of San Piezo. Areas before these positions were heavily mined and held a confusion of barbed wire and booby traps. On the afternoon before, D-Day and H-Hour were communicated to battalion commanders. December 8th, at 0620 hours, the 1st Battalion of the 143rd Infantry Regiment to attack the summit of 1205, having moved up the mountain under cover of darkness, and upon achieving its objective to attack along the ridge to a point northwest of San Pietro. The 3rd Ranger Battalion likewise to attack 950, another feature of the Mount Simocro Hillman. The 2nd Battalion of the 143rd to attack over the terraced olive orchards northeast of San Pietro. The 3rd Battalion acting in support to follow the 2nd at 400 yards. Of the original force to establish the beachhead of Salerno, the 143rd had since spent all but a fortnight in action under extremely bitter weather conditions. At Salerno, at the Volturno crossing, it had taken mortal punishment. The task ahead promised no less bloodshed, yet it was undertaken in good spirits and high confidence. The 1st Battalion began the long, rugged climb up Mount Sumucra. As night fell, our artillery opened up, and throughout the night hours, intense fire was laid down on the enemy's main line of resistance. the night, and it was raining at each hour when the 2nd and 3rd Battalion crossed the line of departure. From 200 yards forward, they encountered wires, mines, and automatic fire from pillboxes.
Mortar and artillery were deadly accurate by reason of excellent enemy observation from Mount Lungo overlooking our advance, which continued another 200 to 400 yards. Many men gave their lives in attempts to jump the wire, reach pillboxes, and throw hand grenades through the narrow gun openings. The 3rd Battalion was committed. Advance never got more than 600 yards past the line of departure. Our initial assault on San Pietro had been repulsed with heavy casualties. The attack on Hill 1205, however, was a brilliant success. Leading elements of the 1st Battalion had gained the summit of the objective before a strongly entrenched enemy knew that an assault was in progress. Right of 1205, the 3rd Ranger Battalion had also captured its objective, but only after successive attacks and costly casualties. For on Hill 950, the enemy was not taken unaware. Counterattacks were to be expected on both 1205 and 950. They were not long developing. during the early daylight hours, and even as it was beaten off, another took form. Day and night they followed, in unremitting violence. of enemy dead mounted with each new attempt. The German prisoners captured on 1205 and 950 said that they had been ordered to retake those positions at all costs. Acting in excellent cooperation, the artillery supporting power disrupted numerous enemy counterattacks while they were in the process of being formed. In addition to defending Hill 1205, the 1st Battalion, obedient to the field order, undertook the reduction of enemy defenses which were organized along the ridge running west.
December, the 1st Battalion was reinforced for the 504th Parachute Battalion, which took over and maintained the defenses of 1205 and 950, thereby enabling the 1st Battalion to throw its entire remaining strength into the assault along the ridge. But the 1st strength had dwindled and shrunk in the five days past. And there was now a question as to whether its existing numbers were sufficient to prevail. Reports during the night of the 14th of December stated that the enemy was offering bitter resistance and that the issue was in grave doubt. Meanwhile, on the olive terraces below, the 2nd and 3rd Battalion had twice again attempted to reach their objective. Both times they had come up against a wall of automatic weapon, mortar, and artillery fire. Volunteer patrols made desperate attempts to reach enemy positions and reduce strong points. Not a single member of any such patrol ever came back alive. Our attacking forces were furnished excellent aerial cover by Allied fighter patrol. But now and then, enemy planes were able to slip through and to bomb and strafe our position. Which to all purposes had remained unchanged since the first day. To break the deadlock, orders were given for a coordinated divisional attack. The 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 143rd to proceed in the execution of the original orders. Acting in conjunction, Company A of the 753rd Tank Battalion to attack San Pietro from the east over the high road. One battalion of the 141st to attack over the flat valley floor. After nightfall on D-Day, the 142nd Infantry Regiment to attack the heights of Mount Lungo. In preparation for the attack, all 5th Army artillery within range, including tanks and all tracks, was directed against San Pietro and the surrounding area. line of departure, to be borne down and held powerless under the weight of enemy fire. The 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 143rd advanced some 100 yards beyond their former positions to a point almost directly before forward enemy defenses. And for the third time, they were forced to take such cover as the quaking earth could offer and the tanks. Orders were for them to enter the town and to locate and destroy the heavy weapons there, which were leveled against our attacking foot soldiers. The high road into San Pietro was a narrow mountain road, and from the beginning of its winding descent into Leary Valley, it was under direct enemy observation. 
started down that road. Three reached the outskirts of the town. Of these, two were destroyed and one was missing. Five tanks were immobilized behind enemy lines their crews having to abandon them. Five tanks hit mines within our lines were thereupon destroyed by enemy gunfire. Four tanks returned to the bivouac area. After dark, two companies, one from the 2nd Battalion and one from the 3rd, finally succeeded in penetrating enemy positions before San Pietro. But receiving both frontal and flanking fire, they were forced to retire. Company E, having been reduced in strength to eight riflemen, and Company L, faring little better. Mastamokro Ridge, the 1st Battalion fought its way to within a few hundred yards of the objective. But it had paid for ground gained at the rate of a man a yard, and it did not have strength to carry the fight any further forward. On Mount Lungo, however, despite bitter resistance, battalions of the 142nd in successive waves kept pushing upward. in the early daylight hours of the 16th of December, its foot soldiers had gained the summit and were wiping up what remained of a stubborn enemy. And that height proved to be a key position in the enemy plan of defense. For even as Mount Lungo fell, the enemy throughout the San Pietro area made preparations to withdraw. Almost invariably, the enemy will counterattack to cover the withdrawal. The first violent thrust was delivered within a few hours. And thereafter, counterattacks came in waves. The roar of the last mingling with the rush and fury of the next to break. Many companies lost all their officers. Enlisted men came forward as inspirational leaders to rally their battered companies into resisting yet one more onslaught. Our own artillery was brought to fall within a hundred yards of our front line elements. Five hours during which the earth never ceased to tremble, counterattacks ended, indicating the withdrawal of the enemy's main body had commenced.
an effort to maintain contact, our patrols immediately pushed ahead. Entering the town, they discovered that San Pietro was ours for the taking. The second and third battalions, less than a rifle company in strength, weary to death who were alive, stumbled forward past San Pietro to consolidate gains and re-establish contact with the enemy, now taking up new positions some five kilometers beyond. That is the broad shape of the Battle of San Pietro, which was but the first of many battles in Leary Valley. It was a very costly battle. After the battle, the 143rd Infantry Regiment alone required 1,100 replacements. The lives lost were precious lives to their country, to their loved ones, and to the men themselves. For the living of the 143rd Infantry Regiment, more than 100 decorations for acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. Many among these you see alive here have since joined the ranks of their brothers in arms who fell at San Pietro. For ahead lay San Vittore, and the Rapido River, and Casino, and beyond Casino, more rivers, and more mountains, and more towns, more San Pietro, greater or lesser, a thousand. As the battle passed over and beyond San Pietro, westward, townspeople began to appear, coming out of their caves in the mountains, where they had stayed in hiding during the enemy occupation.
military aim being to engage and defeat the enemy, the capture of the town itself and the liberation of its people is of an incidental nature. But the people, in their military innocence, look upon us solely as their deliverance. It was to free them and their farmland that we came. Behind our lines, southwest to the sea, the fields are green with growing crops planted after our coming by other people of other towns who believe likewise. The new one earth at San Pietro was plowed and sown. It should yield a good harvest this year. People prayed to their patron saint to intercede with God in behalf of those who came, delivered, and passed on the 
the north with the passing battle. In 1940, Donald Kingaby was a sergeant in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve and a fighter pilot in a Spitfire. Today he writes technical manuals. He lives with his wife and three children in London. After the fall of France, I thought we were in for trouble, big trouble. But Winston Churchill's spirit had its effect on all of us. We knew that we were going to carry on, that we would fight hard and that somehow we would win. In 1940, Harry Siegert was a sergeant in a German Luftwaffe and a recent graduate of a bomber school. A former resident of Berlin, Germany, he works today in Los Angeles as a supervisor of computer systems. My boyhood dream was to fly. It was for me the most beautiful and gratifying experience. Too bad it had to be through war. By the time the war ended, my wounds made flying for me impossible forever. Now I get a feeling of speed and excitement from my boat. In the skies of a war-torn Britain, the lives of Sergeants Kingaby and Sigurd will cross. Two fighting men, one British, one German, relive that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. In the summer of 1940, Adolf Hitler has Europe under his heel. He turns to Great Britain. The English stand alone. The German government makes it clear that surrender terms will not be harsh. But Churchill replies that the British will fight on the beaches, in the villages, and in the fields. Hitler orders his chiefs of staff to complete work on Operation Sea Lion a detailed plan for the invasion of England. The Battle of Britain has begun. United Kingdom. One of the German airmen who will carry out Goering's orders is Sergeant Harry Siegert, stationed with a bomber squadron near Reims, France. I would truly like to find a fighting man who isn't afraid of dying. They may feel that we can win the war. Harry Siegert, after being hit over Coventry, is shot down by a Spitfire over the channel. He will spend many weeks in a German hospital. Later, he fights at Stalingrad and the Battle of the Bulge, and is captured by the Russians in 1945. Sergeant Donald Kingaby pilots numerous missions for the Royal Air Force, and is credited with 23 enemy aircraft brought down. During the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe lost over 2,300 aircraft. The British lost 600 fighters. The citizens of Britain paid an even greater price. So concludes history's last great air duels.
Thank you.